Thanks for tuning in to the World XP Podcast. If you're enjoying the content, please drop us up, drop a like, and let us know your thoughts below in the comments. Also, please consider supporting our podcast via the link below. It really helps us out. Paul, welcome to the World XP Podcast. Um, for those listening who have no idea who you are, do you want to do a quick intro and then we can kind of jump into things? Sure. Um, my name is Paul Diemer. I'm a horn player. Um, I also play drums and piano, but my primary instruments are trumpet and trombone. Um, I teach jazz trombone at uh, the Uni- University of Texas in Austin, um, and I play both brass instruments in all sorts of different contexts, bands, touring, studio, uh, rock bands, um, Afrobeat, classical, jazz, Kill Tony. Um, so, you know, it's it's kind of the, the nature of the beast, um, as a horn player, at least, to wear all the hats and just get in where you can, get in everywhere. So... Um, I think that's a good start. I'm from El Paso, Texas. Um, so yeah, that's just the musical side of me. Uh, but uh, we can get into the other stuff as we progress through the through the through the pod. So yeah, that's a good start. Hundred percent. So um, for those listening who also don't know, I played trumpet all the way through high school, and Kill Tony, as you mentioned, is one of is a show that I watch fairly frequently. And Matt Muling, uh, who's been on the show a few times before. Um, he is also in the band. He's the guitarist in the band. And so when you joined, um, when you joined in my head, I was like, Oh, that's interesting. I had not pictured a spot for a, for a horn, a brass instrument in given the setting specifically, just given the fact that some of the, the notes you start on are super. And I mentioned this to Matt as well. I was like, I know that some of the, like for David Lucas, um, for his intro song and even Hans, like, the note you start on is high. And I I remember the first time hearing it and you nailed it. And I was like, oh, that's impressive. Because with no, like, I know you would warm up beforehand, but to go to jump up to that, to that note on the, fir- on the first one, I was like, oh, wow, I should, I want to talk to him. So how did you, I guess, how did you end up doing that? Or like, what's your experience been um, with that group? And was that ever something that you envisioned coming up as a, as a brass, as a brass player? Or horn player, I guess. No, I mean, I don't know if anyone of the the band members envisioned being a, a part of a gig like that, you know, at any point in their, their life. I could definitely speak for myself. I never predicted anything like this would happen. Um, for me, on the horns as a gig, uh, professionally or otherwise. But, um, you know, I, I, I checked out the, the podcast with Matt, and uh, it's similar in a lot of ways how I got brought into the fray. Um, a little bit later, you know, I've been in the band almost a year, um, so I'm kind of a, a later addition, which is typical for horn players. We're often kind of an accent um, that's added to the to the full the full meal, so to speak. Uh, but um, it's very similar. I've, I've been playing with Matt for t- uh, twelve years, I think, about twelve years of, of, uh, of playing in different bands with him. We played in a band called Prager which has a lot of uh, record, records out under, with our, our buddy Brian uh, Donahoe. And those are those records are on uh, on iTunes and everything. But that, that band was really formative for both of us. Did a lot of tours. And then I've known John for a while too, maybe eight to 10 years of playing in different bands. I played with Gary Clark Jr. Um, I've done a couple of hits with him on horns. Trombone then. Um, D Madness is just an Austin staple. So, you know, I've crossed paths with him uh, because of that. And then Mikey, we played it with a uh, drummer, uh, Gonzalez. We played it in um, Gary Clark's band, and um, we've done a couple of other things too. Uh, some Gina Chavez stuff back in the day, about five years ago, four four years ago, something like that. But yeah, that's that's basically it. We, we all kind of run in the, in a crew together, and we have uh, uh, adjacent, you know, musical circles that we exist in. And so um, I think uh, what was it? Someone was going to be out of town. It might have even been John was going to be out of town with Gary on, on, on uh, you know, at the same time as the Kill Tony gig. So he, he hit me up and asked if I wanted to sit in. And so that was kind of my intro officially um, into it. It was like about this time last summer. And um, I was like, fuck yeah, let's do it. And uh, I think that kind of, you know, evolved from that point. So how, thinking back to my own, like experiences when when you when you got the call in your head how did you envision it going for 
for a horn player just just within the nature of what you guys are being asked to do and what the nature of the gig is it's not it's not a musical gig you guys are an accent or a or a background to a different thing that's going on how does that work from i guess just generally as a professional musician but two for you personally as something to get used to was it difficult for you to get used to to that experience or how or did you have gigs that were kind of similar in in a way that you were that you kind of knew what was going on or how did that work for you well that's that's a great question like i play in i've never had a gig that was like kind of talk showy where we do plan well that's not true we i, I did some gigs in arizona where it was more like the the uh johnny carson we, we it was a big band thing and we did that every year we played sinatra music and they had like all these rich donors come up and talk and do their bits and do all this crap and then we'd play look be a lady tonight and play them off the stage and stuff and it'd be all like this and we'd be in our tuxes so like similar but very different like to totally different like Hill Tony comes from that, right? Like we wouldn't, I think we wouldn't have that if we didn't have those old talk shows and the, the fryer um, roasts and all that. But uh, mm -hmm. but honestly, I, I really didn't know what to expect at the time. It was only a year ago. So I, I'd only been playing trumpet two and a half years. Um, so I started playing trumpet at the beginning of quarantine. Once the uh, the hammer came down for, for us to stay at home, I just was like, all right, this is really bizarre and surreal and I just fell into this for hours you know trying to figure out fingerings and this is like my stimming I like to stim I'm yeah. constantly doing this my stimulation uh and so I fell into that in kind of a therapeutic way but going into the gig I, I really had no idea what to expect I'm not sure if I even checked out the podcast before I it, it was it was pretty um, informal and John's a, a man of, of a few words. So he was just like, yeah, just show up and hang out. And I was like, cool. And I had no idea what to expect, but I, I was overwhelmed that first gig uh, with, you know, the caliber of uh, comedians they had on, on the panel, the full house. It was at Vulcan then. Yeah. Um, the band's great. I'm good. I'm quick on my feet usually musically, but all the other stimulation like in the room was like, I, I was kind of, shocked i was a little you know struck by by everything that was going on stimulation wise so that was an interesting introduction into that whole thing and um yeah i i definitely want to get more into the trumpet stuff but but as far as uh the intro into that situation it was it was uh it was a surprise it took me uh by surprise for sure um uh, because of all that so yeah 100 percent. because i remember i went to a show at, at vulcan and I don't I don't think you were playing yet. And I remember seeing I think you joined maybe a few weeks later or something like that. And where you were on the stage, I remember thinking I would be very uncomfortable with if I had my if I had my trumpet, but you have you had your trombone as well. Yeah. Being in the corner of the stage, people walking by you and then all of a sudden as soon as somebody because Matt explained kind of how you guys do the music, like somebody will have an idea and they'll be like, Oh, okay, we're gonna play this song and then that song. And I was like oh i would need time like time to figure things out or to make sure it's the right notes and then the right key and what temp what tempo people are going in because the trumpet like if you mess up is very obvious like, <laughs> yeah. if, like if you're too slow or the like the like the note is wrong because it's loud yeah. and it cuts through um other sound whereas like if you're in unless you have a really good ear, like a bass note being wrong, not that D madness ever makes mistakes, but like a bass note being wrong, unless you have an ear for it, just kind of, you can get away with it a little bit more. So that's why I, I was like, and did it take you a while to get used to it? And then, cause you were new, I guess you were new, Trump, well, new ish playing trumpet at the time. Yeah. So yeah. how did that work out with one trumpet versus trombone, but then the stage placement, getting used to the, the format and, and everything else so that take a little bit of a little while as well yeah i mean it took some adjusting i i because i didn't know what the gig was about you know i did go in there thinking all right like here i've been working on trumpet you know on my own during quarantine for a couple of years still a beginner you know by all accounts like two years in like 
I sounded like shit on trombone two years in, and everybody really does as a brass instrumentalist. It's a hard yeah. brass is super difficult. Uh, they're super difficult instruments to play. The the vibrating parts are is the body very much like a singer. It's not a string. It's not a drum head. So there's a lot that has to do with endurance and muscle building and just powering through the pain. And so that's a big factor in all of it. And it's very different from trombone in that everything's super compact and, mm -hmm. and compressed compared to trombone. Um, so it's, it's definitely a different vibe. But uh, I saw initially saw that gig as an opportunity to add experience points to my trombone playing. Like, oh, great, like here's, here's a gig. We're coming off of the heels of, of quarantine. And this can be a great opportunity for me to work on my trumpet playing. Little did I know that we're playing to a house of, well, I, I don't know, 250. I don't remember how many people, 150, 250 people. Yeah, were something in. like that. A couple hundred. Yeah. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> so, you know, you mentioned like coming in on the right note on some of those tunes, man. We all make mistakes, you know, on that gig. And, and that's just part of improvised music and being a musician and being human. But I definitely felt exposed. And after a while, like after I realized what it was that I was, uh, you know, going to be a part of, I, I definitely had a lot of insecurities about my trumpet playing. I mean, I just had didn't have really much experience um, outside of the practice room. And uh, I was fracking a lot of notes. Um, I had some trouble. I, I, you know, it's, it's weird. I, I have going into that gig after I realized what it was, I had these insecurities and like, all this like almost overly cautious overthinking approach to bringing this new horn on stage but then i'd make an impulse decision on the back end and, and try to play william wills you know william montgomery's um walk on music and octave yeah. up you know i try to play it up an octave and, and i just wasn't ready for that so <laughs> it's, i screwed that up plenty of times and every time i was like man, I'm going to get this. Like I, I can hear it in my head and I was able to get it, uh, you know, a couple of times in practice. And then, you know, like we're, we're sitting there, we're not playing constantly. So yeah. the chops, you know, go out a little bit and then here comes, you know, oh, the, the big red machine. And I just like, you know, frack the shit out of it. So that was humbling. I, I I really tried. I really wanted to get that down. But, you know, after a couple of months, it probably took longer than I should have let it. But after a couple of months, I, you know, reverted back to doing it down an octave or on trombone and, and uh, you know, accepted my fate there that I needed some more time on the trumpet. So it's just it was a lot of mixed emotions of being overwhelmed, um, knowing that I have the training in the ear to pick up whatever I hear on stage, you know, in the moment, but also realizing that I'm on my fifth instrument and that that kind of takes away from the edge that I had with my ears. Um, so it was just like a balancing act and uh, decision-making and nerves um, going into that of, of playing with these badass musicians and then playing this badass show. So it was a lot, man. Like I, uh, I'm, um, how do I, I'm neurodivergent, so um, I'm ADD and I'm autistic. And so that was played into a lot of it too. And that after I realized what the show was, I had a lot of anxiety, like just with overstimulation and, and um, also some stuff that happened before I got on the show. And um, I realized that I could use the show and the whole experience as a way to like address my social issue, like anxieties and address yeah. my ability to speak and also come to find out I can steal scripts and words and responses from the comedians and Tony because it's constant confrontation, constant interaction. And so it's like, oh, that's what you can do when such and such happens. So it's just, it was just a ton of stuff where I was taking notes, but also scared and then also new to the horn. And then also, so it was, it was a lot, man. It was, it was a very overwhelming experience that I think just within the last month, I'm slowly starting to feel just at ease and I, there's not much of a, a blip in between when I'm not on, on that show and when I am. So yeah, it's, it's been I was, intense. I was going to mention that like the, the last couple of months. Um, so the way that my schedule works out, I watch like I have them on in, in my commute in the car on Tuesday mornings, um, the show. And so I was going to say, I've noticed the last couple of months I've noticed like, you've been more way more consistent in a good in a good way as i was listening for it because it's something that i know like from i'd been doing it for years so it's something that i know and i'm familiar with so i would hear 
here are the here are the various things that you're talking about and i was like oh and every time every time i was i never when you say you crack notes it's like for people listening that don't understand how difficult it is to to not be constantly playing for a certain amount of time it's so hard to get the basically the speed of air going through your chops into the horn correctly within the right fingering so the tone like the tonality is accurate and when that is not the case the note cracks basically um and so for you i was like every time i was like yeah you're gonna get it next time <laughs> but it's, yeah, been, yeah. it's been good but also to uh, your point shit. about about using the show as kind of a way to um to address some of the social things that's super interesting i hadn't it hadn't even occurred to me but also it makes sense because people from the outs outside or people who are not used to being on stage or in some sort of spotlight often don't think they think oh that person is up there so therefore they're not nervous or they're used to it or all of those things so that's interesting to me that you were using it as a totally unrelated way to the what you were there to do how did that like was that something that you consciously thought of or did you just realize at one point that you were doing it how, that's super interesting to me that you mentioned that that it was something so pertinent to how you interact with the show that you would mention it here so was that something that you thought of you're like you know what i'm gonna start to take notes in this way or was it something that you just had a conversation with somebody randomly and then you used something that you saw on the show and then afterwards you're like oh i just did that and then you thought of it or was it kind of both or mixed or just gradual potentially mixed i you know i've always i mean uh, being autistic it, it's something that always was and always will be there for me so there's always been me kind of watching these people who are able to interact with others and, and people gravitate towards these people and i'm kind of over here like oh, okay what what makes what how do they do that what makes that work for them and what you know and so that that's always been kind of on my radar and i've always been trying to figure that out perpetually to what often seems like no avail but uh but as I mature and, and get more more outside of my head, um, it's it's become easier. So it's kind of perpetual. But on the show, I didn't realize until after, like, it might have been the second or third show where I was like, oh, shit, like, this gets really confrontational. And the roasting is interesting. Um, and actually, I, I you know, I've been a fan of comedy for a while, so I, I have watched a lot of the roasts. With Jeff Ross and um, uh, who was the guy that used to be a lawyer who passed? Who was also a a comedian, a short dude. I'm forgetting his name right now. He was a badass. He he had briefly had a sitcom. Ah, it'll, his name will come back to me. Uh, Patrice O'Neill, Bill Burr. All these guys yeah. are so quick, and I'm just like, man, I like I wish I had that. Um, and then to be right like four feet away from that, it really clicked in a whole other way, where even with William Montgomery, where he says, why would you say something like that? Why would you say, you know, that's yeah. such a great way. If someone, because in the music business, there's a, a ton of passive aggressive and like weird people that you can come across, any any business, any yeah, yeah. And that's such a great way to handle that, to, add, to use a question to take the wind out of the sails of someone who's kind of being toxic because it forces them to explain their behavior instead of me just to assume, well, you, you're doing this thing to me. Well, they're going to just respond with, no, I'm not. And then it's like, it's over. It's shut down. But yeah. like, and he, I don't even know if he thinks about this, but I'm sitting here like analyzing it. Be like, yes, this step, uh, to phrase it this way, take these words. And I'm like practicing it in my head. If, if, you know, how to ask a question, if something seems off to me to use questions, you know, to, to kind of come to clarity, not every time. Uh, is someone being passive aggressive but either way just like that's a great example of like why would why would you say that and it's yeah. like it because it was so effective like they're sitting there roasting each other out of fun out of good you know good heart yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's still impromptu it's not scripted so when he responds that way with someone who's kind of giving him shit they're kind of caught off guard and i was like damn 
that works. So stuff like that. And, and Tony is so quick too. He's just a gunslinger. Um, yeah. so, so with him as well, confidence, delivery, using a question to disrupt some, some sort of agenda that somebody else might have. It's just, I'm kind of like, ah, this is, these are great ways to navigate um, the professional realm in ways where I'm not being antagonistic, right? Like William intentionally is like, what? you know, he yells at him. Yeah. But I can I can reshape that and be like, well, what did you mean by that? And that's not an antagonistic thing at all. And it's actually very effective and can take the, the wind out of someone who is being toxic, like take the wind out of their sails. So, yeah. you know, it's just by sitting there show after show and just like it sinks in like, holy crap, these guys are really good at dealing with people and being confident and accepting themselves, at least on stage, just that comfort and the comforts and, and the delivery and like, the training, I feel like William has had some like theater background with using yes and and, and things of that nature. It's just it's just amazing. Yes and is such a great way to, to continue conversations with people, which I suck at. I'm horrible at it. Like, I don't remember to ask what and how questions, like open-ended questions. I, I still struggle with that. I still have to like think about it first to understand it. And then I have to actively think about it in a conversation to make it happen. It's work. <laughs> yeah. But I learned I learned from the show. And I love yeah. it. Yeah. No, hundred percent. Yeah, the what do you mean by that is always uh it, it cracks me up every time because it's yeah. so it's so simple and it and the people like most why of the time would you say that? Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean by why would you say that? <laughs> why would you say that? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, it works every time. There's been a few like really, really funny. Like uh, I think Chris Stefano was on. He was like, "Oh, you look like an, a dad that like left his kids at baseball practice or whatever." He's like, "Why yeah, did yeah. you say that?" <laughs> it's like, uh, <laughs> he's like, "I don't know." <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember that. I remember that one. I think Chris Stefano was wearing like a cool shirt, like button up. I, think, pur- I, I think the purple one. Yeah, the yeah, purple yeah, shirt. Yeah. Somebody was wearing purple. I don't remember exactly. I think that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, dude. He's 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 something else on on stage when i got to saw when i got to see him up close i was like wow that's that's something else because uh what a guy um talking about chris or or william william yeah yeah he's he's kind of like a multi-dimensional comedian up there and it's beautiful it's very creative yeah one one of the one of the funniest things that he did was um and it was so it, it was funny because the camera work that whoever was filming and when he brought the bag of fortune cookies and was just opening them <laughs> yeah. the, the camera the camera just zoomed into the floor where the fortune cookies were just crumpled up by his feet and it made it it made it a lot funnier but yeah he yeah. like the creativity with the synthesizer when he came up with that dumb song about the dog that he didn't have um, <laughs> yeah. and the fortune cookies and just all like the the raisin bread and all the other things that are just so random but somehow he makes them funny it's it's something else man it's something else his all the sponsorships that he that he has are, yeah it's very like there's some definitely some andy kaufman vibe there for sure yeah uh, some, some great stuff all right so obviously you do more things than just kill tony but that's why i know you from so we talked about that some sure what was your first instrument were you brass first or were you the other ones first so when i was really young um i became obsessed with uh the drums and i think that was i think what is that called um that, that in hindsight was actually uh one of the first indicators of some sort of neurodiversity mm-hmm. is this was like early early on where i just wanted a, a a practice pad and i got i luckily got one for christmas my parents got me one it's sticks and then i would just draw on everything and play them all the time and i'd be on the internet looking at vicfirth.com and drumworld.com and annoying yeah. the, eventually in middle school and then in high school, just annoying the crap out of everyone because I, you know, I couldn't read the room um, about teach me drums and marching band. And so it was, it, I had a major drum obsession um, for, for years um, from a very young age. Uh, and there's a lot of repetition, you know, and yeah, that's, yeah. that's good for me. I need that. And um, I used to get in trouble in, in class all the time for drumming, for tapping, just perpetually you know I, I had a roommate that called me perpetual noise <laughs> that was my nickname <laughs> so yeah you know so i feel bad for him and you know in hindsight but um but I that, wasn't so that far was... off i got in trouble for that as well when i was in school for just tapping and drumming along and yeah yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just, that's just what the way it was. That was the reality. But um, drums first, then uh, um, uh, trombone. Uh, I, I, w- I actually tried out in, in sixth grade for drums. I wanted to, to do it so badly, but um, for whatever reason, it, it didn't work out. Uh, there was like 15 people auditioning for drums and then no trombonists. And my sister, who's four years older than me, um, played trombone and she had just left middle school and maybe a year before and had the same band director and then my parents we had a trombone in the house and all this stuff so there was some convenience element uh to it and hand me down of of well your sister played trombone there's 20 drummers auditioning we don't have any trombone players you're six foot well you i was probably around six feet then but i had long arms Mm -hmm. so how about the trombone instead (laughs) instead so, I, you know, that's that was the start of the trombone I was in middle school. And you said, was was the other one guitar or piano? Was the other one and then trumpet? Drums. Um, I, I drums? did. Use... How many you said? Because you said trumpet was your fifth, your fifth instrument. Correct. What are the other so, two? So I guess drums were first, technically. Yeah. Then trombone. I learned, a, I, I did a little bit of baritone during summer band, but that would come to later. Um. Then after that, it was uh, uh, piano, and then uh, trumpet, and along with trumpet came baritone because it's valves, and I already right, have right. the face, the face going. So um, those are my five, and I, I do some singing as well. But um, yeah, that's kind of the order: drums, trombone, piano, uh, trumpet, and baritone. It's kind of at the same time. At what at what point did you? decide or feel like hey i can i want to do this full time or did you did you go to college or did you study it or like at what point did you decide that you wanted to pursue music as life you know i i wish i was that self aware i um you know i've been reading a lot about this stuff and my mental makeup and and a big part of is of it is having like a, a smaller um prefrontal cortex and what that means, it, it means many things. But one of the things that it means is um, like executive function and being able to see a bigger picture of things and understand and put deduce by many things and take a step back and look at it and then draw conclusions or plan things or whatever. But I, I, that's something I struggle with to this day and very much so at that age to where I was just taking it moment at, at a time. Mm. And um you know, like I just happened to be good and then I got better and then I found some success. So it was all just these little things that without almost me even being conscious of it led me into studying it in university and then I, just more kind of successes with failures, but more successes and hard work and everything. And eventually like sometime it must have been in college, you know, it was it was almost like, I don't even know if in college I was like, well, this is what I'm going to do full time. It just seems like it always was. I guess what some people call a calling. Uh, yeah. Like I just, it, it always was. It, it, it wasn't anything else for as long as I can remember. Yeah, that makes sense. Let me, let me try and rephrase, I guess what, like for me, I love soccer and everything I do with soccer, but at a certain point, like I still play semi-pro and I'm coaching and doing all these things. But at some point I knew that I wasn't going to play pro, but for some point at you, for you, at some point you must've had, or maybe not you must've, but at some point I'm imagining you had a sort of like, this can work for me. Maybe, maybe rather than a decision, but at some point you're in your head, you're like, okay, well I have to pay for food and a place to live. Right. Like music maybe is not the way or but for, in your case it would be right so for yeah. me i was like i have to get a job because i'm not going to play professionally yada 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 like did you have that was there a moment for you or, or was it similar where you just kind of got a few gigs that were paid and then you got another one that was paid and then eventually you're like oh this is kind of just working out that's a great question and that's pretty that's super awesome about um your your connection with soccer man i played i wasn't I'm not athletic at all, but um, I played soccer for a little bit. It was horrible. Uh, but I, I, you know, like that's such a cool thing, soccer and the, the coordination and everything. It's very cool, especially to get to that level. That's amazing. Um, but uh, with, I, 
again, um, you know, it's on the one hand, I'm like, even, even now, sometimes I'm like, is this the right, is this the right job? Like, this, like, am I going to be able to pay for, honestly, when I got this killed Tony gig, uh, I did, I think about two or three months without being paid, but eventually was able to, um, work out pay. But in that interim, like I was doing DoorDash and like, it, it was a struggle. Like I, I was struggling to to pay rent and pay the bills. I was in some pretty good debt and uh, it wasn't looking good, man. So it's just the nature of, of, of probably being an artist in general of like, just the the fucking roller coaster financially of 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 uh of doing of, of having that pursuit. Um, I'm lucky and super privileged to have parents that are have have been supportive, and I, I think would bail me out if if I it was, if it was between me ending up on the street or not. Right, they would get in there for me. But short of that, you know, it it's it had been a struggle pretty much up until Kill Tony, man. Like it's. It's been taxing and just whatever innate thing that even if I, like I'm in the red and all my bank accounts and like, you know, I've got letters of, of like debt coming in the mail, I'm still find myself thinking about freaking music and trumpet and trombone and getting better. It's just an obsession. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it does. It does. <laughs> and, I, and I think to 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 add on to that what i was getting at is a lot of people i have on the podcast are they work for themselves or they don't work for just some company somewhere and one of the things that always intrigues me about each and every one of those people is how did you get to that point mentally because you have to take the leap at some point of like even if i'm going to door dash i'm going to door dash so i can make this thing work um and that moment there it, most people, there's a moment in which they decide I'm going to take this leap, whether they're going to be a personal trainer or whether they're going to be a musician or an artist or, or whatever, whatever it is, there's, or, there's always generally like one. So that's kind of what I was getting at, but that makes sense. What, what you were saying as well. Um, so you said you also teach at university of Texas or university of Texas in Austin. Yes. Yeah. And you've done yeah, other yeah. other gigs as well. So can you maybe walk through your your musical journey from a like preference might not be the right word, but you've been OK. So you're exposed to jazz and then classical and then all these other things. Given the nature of being a professional musician and kind of if you're not a resident somewhere, the gigs that you're getting, you have to kind of be. Like if you don't like jazz, but somebody offers you a jazz gig, it's like, all right, well, I'm going to play that anyways. It's so like, where was your journey with, with that through college and finding things that you liked and didn't like? And I don't, it's a, it's a very open-ended question, but I guess how was your journey through college figuring out what you liked and didn't like and, and what you wanted to do with it, whether or not you wanted to teach or play or both or all of those things? It, yeah, it's a good question. It, it's definitely a, a wide open one. Um, you know, it, it was quite the journey. And you mentioned a leap, and it feels like a, a, a decade and a half long leap, to be honest. Like, uh, but um, in college, that was tricky because while I had the diagnosis for ADD, I didn't for autism. And at that time, there were social media like facebook was just like happening I, I graduated undergrad in 2000 what was that eight and i think facebook might have been 04 or 06 or something so it was just happening social media wasn't where it was so i didn't we didn't have all these reels and all these instagram accounts informing us for better or for worse about neurodivergence and whatever so i just knew i had it and i knew that i didn't like taking the pills so, and that's it. I didn't have any like strategies other than maybe the, the ones I, I acquired, you know, um, growing up with my, the structures that my parents had set up for me. Um, so it was a lot of like, I guess what's called maladaptive, like just being uninformed and then not being able to adapt to interacting with people and society and professionalism and school and all this. So there's a lot of struggle there. And, and actually that took on a I took on an unfortunately bad habit of drinking 
um, in, in lieu of, of that information and of being self-aware um, to, to deal with that, to get rid of all the social issues and and, accept, and be accepted and whatever it was uh, to cope with all, all of that and just became a, a fucking drunk. Um, but uh, it was a, it was a struggle um, aside from those issues of trying to fit in and navigate with with little self-awareness and knowledge of my of what I was working with under the hood. Um, everything else was dedicated to just getting good at, at, at music. I, and, and that's been kind of the approach as a whole, even to this day, it's evolved. But generally speaking, because I, I'm un, I, I didn't find myself gravitating towards a business mindset and having the um, executive function to be able to plan in large arcs and bigger picture elements. Um, I just felt like if, if I give everything to getting better at my instrument, then that'll be my calling card. And that's worked for the most part, you know, with hits or misses rather here and there. Um, yes, I, I, I can't, I'm not a smooth talker and yes, I, I can't go sell a car or whatever, car salesman. But once I put the horn in my face, that's, you know, like I'm, I'm I invested in the talent that I had that I'm lucky and privileged to have. And that was what got me gigs and turned heads. And so through that, it kind of kept me along in the professional world of musicianship and also gave me motivation to get better because that's my main calling card. The other stuff I struggled with and wasn't really interested in either. I kind of, to a fault, reject, rejected developing those aspects of, of my game. So I just played all the time, you know, and, and um, eventually that that evolved from there. But, but that's been kind of the thing. And so, I, you know, I, in undergrad, I studied a lot of classical music and it wasn't until the last third uh, of, of of my undergrad that I really start taking to like jazz in, in an academic sense. But um, jazz is the discipline. And through jazz, um, I'm able to speak music. And that's why I think all, all the guys in the Kill Tony band, at least I know Matt and, and me and, and John, I think to a certain extent, um, that's how we're able to do so, stuff so quickly on the fly. It's all the same 12 tones, but through improv and jazz improv, black American music, we, I, I can now speak those 12 tones and hear them. when they're spoken to me, I can just recite them back almost as if it's a language. So that's been like the discipline, not the end, but the means to an end. So yeah. I hope that a lot of no, tangents, does. but I hope that, that kind of. It does. Now that you mentioned that all of you guys have done jazz, that makes sense. The ability to pick up the pop music and the different songs. So it makes, it makes more sense. Um, did you have I had a thought that escaped me? Uh, let's see if it'll come back. No, it won't. Um, when you, <laughs> <laughs> when you were, so when you talk about undergrad and you got into jazz, at some point, did you, or maybe jazz a little bit more from a, from an academic sense, at what point are you... Like how I guess how did you how did you figure your way into the world of professional musicianship? Or like people have been on a cruise ship. There's people that are in cruise ship bands. There's people that are in uh, doing only classical things. There's people that go into like oh I want to play my instrument for like movie soundtracks and scores. Or there's people that say oh I want to do pop music or I only want to do jazz or I'm doing background music for some dance troupe or like what are, like there's a gazillion ways that you can go for a professional musician you can be in the studio it can be all these all these things how did you figure out or how did you find your way in those and how much have you dabbled in or what's been what's been your professional journey from that sense from the gigs that you've gotten and and things like that uh, yeah yeah absolutely that's kind of a nice uh, follow-up um, to the previous question. Um, yeah, this is great because it's just like, this is uh, some good info dumping like a, a, you know, for, that, I, that I get to do during this whole thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, what, what the good, uh, one of the many good things coming up through academia as a jazz major, um, there's, there's some not so great things and then there's some good things. And one of them is that we are kind of brought into or worked into a network of other people um, who are musicians that eventually become your coworkers after you graduate. And also 
you know, the universities are typically ingrained into the, to the whatever city they're in, like the, the musical community. So a lot of times um, contractors will hit up UT, for example, oh, we need a quartet for this cocktail thing we're having for this business or this whatever party. And they'll go to the school and ask for that. So there's a lot of that too. Um, another facet of that is that the professors are typically also gigging musicians. So they're not only at school, but they're professionals. And if you are playing at a certain level, they'll either use you as a sub or there might be kind of a lower pressure gig and they'll bring you on kind of as like a mentorship um, to play the gig with them. So there's a lot of this like network and communal kind of thing that can that is brought about through the academia, that academic um, lane or whatever um, institution that uh, that helps with that. And I had some of that in Arizona, in Tucson, Arizona, where I did my undergrad, and also in Miami, where I did my graduate school. And um, in both cases, I was very green, I was dealing with my issues. And, you know, thankfully, I played really well. And, and I, I was responsible enough. There's many <laughs> times, cringe moments thinking back that, like, God, what was I thinking? Like, how, you know, how green was I? But we all have those. And, um, but I learned, I cut my teeth, so to speak, through those um, interactions and those kind of um, introductory gigs. And from there, I've been able to build, to build experience and relationship with people. And then when I moved to Austin, I was able to kind of have the same types of gigs and get involved in the same types of communities because there's connections or bridges between UT and Miami and UT and University of Arizona and Miami. Like I know professors uh, who are, this one guy who's uh, the head of the jazz department at um, University of Arizona, who went to school in Miami with me and who actually um, went out for the job as the, the jazz chair. Or you would see the, the jazz chair or the piano professor at UT. So he's all three of those, like he has a connection there. It's a small world for, for like our, the jazz instrumentalist. For sure. And so a lot of that has helped me find work on upon exiting school. But school's been a, a great facilitator of that. Um, and then from there, hopefully that's a nice launch pad for other people to hear me. And, and then jams have been good for that, too, where you've got people who have been around a city for years and old heads that are, are maybe hitting up a jam just to listen. And then you have all the young new new people to the city come in and play and they're like, oh, I could use this person for wedding gigs or this person for a, a private big band gig or I need a horn player for a studio session. So um, that was kind of how I got my start was just doing all these like freelance, not no name, like name gigs with Gary Clark or Kill Tony or John Batiste or whatever it is. You know, it was just cover band stuff, recording session with this indie artist, you know, local guy, this, that, and the other. But thankfully, through jazz, Black American music, I'd like to, I'd like to say, um, I could speak the language, regardless of the genre. So that all that kind of helped me get off the ground after school. Yeah, that makes sense. I remember the thing I was going to say earlier is when you said small world, the thing I was going to say earlier was when um, it was based off you saying that you weren't really good at the talking or the business part, but you really just wanted to get better at your craft. And I feel like for every industry, the people who at a certain point, the level of talent and expertise expertise kind of speaks for itself and the world gets smaller and smaller, the better you get at whatever the thing is. Um, and so to the, to your point about saying it kind of speaks for itself at a certain point, it, it is right. You're still like the, what's the percentage of musicians from high school that make it as professional musicians probably close to not close to none and so i think to your point about it speaking for itself is extremely valid like you're sitting here as a professional musician so that's super cool the then i had another thought based on what you just said before and it kind of ties into your earlier earlier point about the neuro neurodivergent stuff and you're also teaching at the university how why did you decide was it was this another for you a thing that you wanted to work on social stuff or was it did somebody come ask you to do it and or how has it been for you? How, have you have you been able to adapt? Do you find it easy because it's something that you love to talk about or how has that been for you? It's been good. And let's see if I can remember if I can manage because I had a thought when you were talking about um, like talent and, and, you know, just the ability or whatever being a good calling card. 
Um, and I wanted to, to kind of expand on that. Um, nowadays and for a while, it's, that doesn't, and I don't, that doesn't hold the same amount of weight. We all know this, but I think it, it, it's worth mentioning that because it ties into what you asked about um, deciding that this is what I want to do. I feel like I'm having to actually re um, uh, revisit that bridge because to get to a, more than a local or even a national level, I'm going to have to make a similar decision and it's, I'm not going to just be able to, to write on whatever skill I think I have. Like, that's just not the case anymore. And what more and more to this day and, and for a while now is the currency is the networking and the social media and, and, and being able to brand and build your audience and understand. I was just talking to somebody about thumbnails and all this stuff that's just like mind boggling to me. But that's to, to kind of bring it circle back to something we brought up before is that like, I, I've avoided that stuff almost, well, definitely to a fault, but almost out of resentment, you know, ego and everything. But now I have to come back to the table and be like, well, do I want to do this? You know, make that decision. Is this something I want to do? And if the answer is yes, I have to accept these other things that I'm not good at and that I've been avoiding because of my my own sensitivity, my sensitive ego. Um, so that's, that's a great thing to to speak out into the world and to include hopefully into this conversation. Yeah. But um, absolutely. And then shoot, this is what I thought was going to happen. I, I want to jump fast forward back to the, to the thing that you actually asked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was it again that you, that you mentioned? Um, when you just, or when you started teaching, was that with, with yes. how you are as neuro neurodivergent, was that something that was difficult for you to get into or did somebody ask you if you wanted to do it? Or was it something that you decided that you wanted to do to kind of, help you work on your own stuff or all of the above, I guess. Like, and, and yeah. after you started, was there, was there a difficult adjustment period for you talking in front of people or, or was it, did it come easier because it's something that you love? All of the above. I mean, it, it seems like that's always the case, right? It's never in, in so many ways on so many levels, things just aren't black and white. And, and you know, I feel like the sooner I accept that the easier life is it's just like acceptance. Right. And this is one of these things, too, where I'm great at breaking things down to their fundamental things, musically speaking, and, and on, on brass and, and, and harmony is another thing. Patterns and harmony um, and being able to hear them are all things that I excel at. Um, there was a learning curve for, for articulating that to students and, and trying to meet them at, at where they're at and being able to read um, a student and to, to be able to pick up where they're coming from from where they're at the table. So I, it took a while for me to, to understand that. Um, I was lucky enough to have a master's degree in jazz, jazz performance and there'd be a vacancy at UT. I think actually it was first at Texas State. So I've taught both at Texas State, which is a university just outside of Austin, and then at, at UT a little bit after, but same similar in contexts where there was a vacancy. I have the credentials, they needed someone quick, and I was, you know, more than qualified on, on paper <laughs> to to fill the to fill the uh, the position. And so, uh, through just serendipity and, and and privilege and some some hard work on my end, I don't want to deny that um, I was able to get these gigs. But from there, it took yeah, man, I like being able to get over those insecurities and uh, uh, working with other professors who are super knowledgeable and super academic and super talented. And like not shutting down, being able to talk with them and, and not being aloof or distant and rigid, that was a struggle for me. And, and that's kind of been a, a, just a lifelong theme um, uh, where I'm just overwhelmed can appear as me being cold and distant. And people don't know that. And they, it's impossible for me to expect that, that of them. So it's understandable that from the outside, they see someone who's like not approachable. Right. And so as somebody who needs to network or somebody who's working on teams, that's a hard thing to have about you, this kind of like rigidity or whatever you want to call it. So I had to work through that. And same thing with the students. But um, shoot, I think I've been teaching almost a decade now at, at the university level. And um, it took a lot of trial by fire or error or whatever, making mistakes, getting surveyed at the end of the semester. That's something that happened at both schools. 
um, for me to like change things, accept some hard truths and really meet the students where they're at. And, and it, there's still gonna be more of that growth. But I do, there's something about, you know, I dated someone who had kids and there's a similarity here to where whenever I was their teenage, uh, te uh, te teenagers, and so when I hung out with them, everything was out, out of like any insecurities, it, like that was holy ground because that's such a formative time for them, for these, these young teenagers. Like th there's no room. I just didn't feel like I had any excuse to lose my temper or be toxic or any sort of like slip into any shitty behaviors. And there's something like pure and whole, wholesome when I hung out with them and for the most part, I, I try to enter into that zone with my students at, at the university because I didn't have a great time as a college student um, in, in my undergrad. There were there were some some tough times for me that I had with some not so great professors, and I, in hindsight, realized how that negatively affected me and how hard it was for me to undo that. And it's very much how trauma works in general. And I, there's no way I want to be responsible for that for these students. So once I enter into that headspace, then I can get over a lot of, in turn, get over a lot of my insecurities and the barriers that I have, because there's something bigger and there's something more important um, at hand that needs to happen with these students. And it's about the music and, and, and uh, you know, being a, what do they call that? A steward of, of yeah. the music, of Black American music too, to these to these students to continue a tradition and to, to keep them, um, from getting dark is what we call in jazz school. That guy's getting dark, man. He's getting dark. So that we just want to avoid it. It's it's kind of a sacred ground for me, and that's helped me navigate through the waters at, at the university level. Yeah, that makes total sense as well. I was thinking when you're talking about the the teenagers and kind of being in that zone where you have no excuse. Like the team I coach right now is uh like sixteen year olds, and you you are right, but also they can be absolute dickheads sometimes. They can. <laughs> um, and, and obviously your environment is different than on the field where it's like, if they don't perform like there's different standards of, in terms of, okay, I'm, you guys are running today cause you didn't put any effort in at, at the game or you guys were all late and all these other things. It's a little bit different, but I hundred percent relate to, to what you're saying there. That's cool, man. So You've been doing all of these things, teaching different gigs, studio. You've been in the studio, I assume, before jazz, uh, mm -hmm. Kill Tony, all sorts of different stuff. What is what's your favorite ones to do? Oh, also, actually, before we get to that, um, when you mentioned, so I'm doing the same thing as you, jumping all over the place. When you mentioned okay. professors, professors, that's would my language. Say, <laughs> I speak that language. <laughs> when you say like professors would say, "Oh, I need somebody for this gig. It's lower pressure, or a quartet for this other thing." When that was happening to you, were you only going trom with trombone or were you going with all of, well, not trumpet because it's more recent, but were you going with all m multiple instruments? Just trombone. Yeah, Just trombone. trombone. Yeah, I've been playing trombone 20, 25 years. Both of my degrees are in trombone and I teach at the university level only in trombone. Trumpet's brand new. And then I learned piano because as a music major, we're required to. And then baritone, we already went through that and drums was a side thing. But I took a couple of like, uh, kind of older traditional jazz gigs on drums back when this uh, musician named Slim Ritchie was still alive. I would play with him here in Austin. Um, but I, I don't really take gigs on drums. Uh, I That's more, it's all my main language or, or dialect is through a horn or trombone. And all the other instruments help inform that. Like being a drummer helps me understand what it's like to be a rhythm section player. And same with piano as a supportive role because horn players are out in front, kind of like uh, they're the front line, like vocalists in a way. And so we're doing this and we're relying on the rhythm section for support. And sometimes if, if you don't empathize or if you don't step into the shoes of the rhythm section, like you can abuse the rhythm section like, and no one's going to want to play with you. And also you're not going to be able to reach these peaks in, in a musical improvisational performance if, if you're just like this and you're not sympathizing or empathizing rather with with the rhythm section so it's more just been to get better at trombone even trumpet has been to get better at trombone and and speaking music it's all been tools to get to a larger end yeah that makes sense i would imagine for for drums like you mentioned the rhythm section but then trumpet the way that you have to the way that the airflow goes 
probably has it increased your range on trombone a little um, bit it, it will because yeah. when i took a trumpet i actually i became like so obsessed with it that i put the trombone down for about two almost three years and i lost everything i just that's how brass as you know that's how yeah, yeah. brass playing you just can't take a break so you know after i started on kill tony i realized i needed to have both horns and just in general it's going to make me hireable all around but um i have to rebuild my trombone playing so you know for the last year i've been doing that I, i'm hoping by christmas um the end of this year i'll get back to where i was on trombone or better for, for what you're kind of alluding to is that trumpet everything being so small you have efficiency is key you, yes. or else you're, you're 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 screwed you cannot survive without efficiency and i still have a lot of problems with <laughs> with my efficiency which is why i was literally practicing before this this uh podcast or this interview or whatever but yeah i take all that all back to trombone and it's yeah my my path to uh rebuilding trombone has been that much quicker because of the efficiency i found through trumpet absolutely yeah for sure i remember we because we used to play at graduation every um every year so like when freshman through junior year in high school we would play the graduation and our classes were huge like 400 people and we play pomp, pomp and circumstance for the entire time that everyone was walking and it was a, <laughs> yeah, it that. was it was as, as william says an absolute nightmare um yeah. but the endurance we couldn't do it we couldn't play the whole time so we would stagger how mm -hmm. like take a break for eight bars 12 bars and then jump back in and then somebody else takes a break the the efficiency was was nuts but i think part of it also we were in high school so we didn't really know um but yeah it was afterwards like you couldn't talk to people it was right. strange Pe like people be like, oh you just uh, you just played at graduation that was fun i'd be like mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's like yeah, yeah let I, me go rest i have to watch out how much i smile on kill tony yeah yeah, yeah 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 i'd be like all right hold on hold on just gotta relax here i'm, I'm fucking I'm going. I'm burning through these muscles that I'm going to need. I can't talk, smile because I'm smiling the whole time. Talk, talk on that actually, because I, I that didn't even occur to me. But as soon as you said it, I was like, oh, that makes loads of sense. Was the first couple episodes rough? In oh, in, in which way, like chop wise? Yeah, yeah. Well, it was rough because, I, like I mentioned before, I was like at the very beginning of rebuilding my trombone to like be able to play my my main my master instrument on the gig. Like I had taken two years off of it, so I sound like shit on that. And then trumpet, I was just an infant or a toddler rather. So I'm sat here kind of like struggling on both of these instruments, you know, super vulnerable and embarrassed. So it was a struggle, man. Like on this show that I didn't realize was like as big as it was. So it was tough. And the, the chop thing, it's one thing to have trombone chops, another thing to have trumpet chops, and a whole third thing to be able to go between the two. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, that, for sure. It, it was a challenge, absolutely. Was the, was the first show that you were on when you realized you had to, like, not smile? Or did it take a few? It's It took a few, because I think I was just still so overwhelmed with everything, and it, it didn't occur to me until later, after a few things had settled in, that I, I found myself, I caught myself smiling, and then I could also feel that I was sore from from horn playing and i was like oh shit like i better i better watch out how much i'm smiling here or else you know like i'm not gonna be able to play williams uh walk on music you know so absolutely i can't remember at what point i i considered that or drew that connection but uh but it, it i it's gonna happen again too i'm gonna have to remind myself not to smile like oh snap out of it you're smiling just to save my chops <laughs> yeah, yeah that's remarkable that you realized that it didn't even occur to me i guess i guess maybe it, it would have went when you feel like you're those muscles being it's so sore and you'd be like oh i should probably it's the same ones um what has been your favorite types of gigs or do you have a favorite gig that you've done so far in your in your career or a favorite few or a favorite i don't i don't know a genre of gig the right that's the right wording favorite type of gig that you've done think, yeah of course there's many um you know this i can only speak to this like my own pursuit and as a horn playing artist um and musician that from experience i know that and, and all my peers uh, who do the same thing agree that you, this is one of those things where you can play to which i have you can play radio city music hall 
or play at, at, on the Isle of Wight to, at a festival of 60,000 people and then go play at a club in Austin to, to like one person who's, who's like uh, blessing tables, you know? So it's like anything and, and everything in between these two extremes. But, um, you know, I, I really love playing. I play in this band called the Polyphonic Spree. And it's this like really big, like numerically speaking, it's like at, the, at its biggest, I think we went on tour with like 26 people on one bus. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it's a big like rock orchestra. They actually had a, a pretty good heyday in like the 2000 aughts and were on MTV Music Awards and had some music videos out and did some amazing tours, played Lollapalooza. We were on Scrubs. There's an episode where we're playing on Scrubs and stuff. I wasn't in the band then, but um, I came onto that into that band in like 2013, and at that point it was we were coming down off of that success, but still had some awesome opportunities. We had um, a handful of tours that were just so much fun and formative for me, where we were playing some really cool parties with like the creator of Sponge or uh, Tom Kenny and his band, like who do, who do the SpongeBob songs, was mm-hmm. playing there. Like it was a Simpsons writers party, and that I was like seeing like these stars from these shows, like the guy from Leeds was there and all this stuff. And I was like, oh shit, you know, playing um, Radio City Music Hall for David Boat, the, his tribute concert was super cool. Uh, touring in the UK and Australia and Mexico and the United States. So this band actually really um, gave me a lot of great memories and great relationships with people and uh, experience in improvising music in a non-jazz situation, but using my jazz um, discipline to to figure that out. And so it, it really accomplished a lot of things. So that was super cool. Um, I, I really enjoyed playing with John Batiste. That was awesome too. That was a whole other, that was the real deal. Not that the spree wasn't, the spree is kind of a homegrown thing, a very almost indie vibe, but John Batiste was like, firing on all cylinders and he just won all those uh, Grammys and he's just did it. He just wrote his, uh, his opera, I believe, or his, um, I think it was an opera. I, I can't remember if that, if that, or he did a symphony uh, thing, but uh, it, we were wearing costumes and there was, it was for ACL and it was just huge. Um, that was super memorable. And that was one of like, that was within my inside of the first year of me playing trumpet. I played trumpet on that freaking gig. And it was because of, the connections I had on trombone that they hired me for both. And so I, I had some major imposter syndrome on that gig. Um, and then a, a couple of more gigs with Gary Clark Jr. That was another, those are the, those types of gigs are super memorable and super rewarding for the people and also the hospitality. It's um, you're not sleeping on the floor of hotels, which I've also done, but you know, like nasty floors with like cockroaches and stuff. Um, they actually treat you well and you get to travel and maybe get a cool, gift bag or something so those ones are super memorable for sure yeah the the hard ones are memorable too like we toured with Prager and that was like just we were all in this like passenger van we rented from our friends who play in another van and it got stinky in there and there was 11 of us like shoulder to shoulder (laughs) and we were like driving to New Orleans and sleeping on hotel floors and stuff and that was formative too just in a different way so a ton of great memories that's crazy if you had one piece of advice for sixteen-year-old you, oh shit, <laughs> what would it be? It's tough because knowing sixteen-year-old me, I just don't think I'd listen, you know. And so maybe that would be the, <laughs> the advice. <laughs> uh, you know, we're only receptive at the level of like our, our experience and our humility and our understanding of the world around us. And the things I know now are only through that experience and only because that amount of time has elapsed and only because I had those specific failures in that time. So I don't know how I'd be able to get through my to through to my 16 year old self. You know, I would hope to, to tell them again about the black and white thing, like, like life, life is is hard. It's difficult for everybody. Whether you're you're rich and in Hollywood and and flying private airplanes, or you're you know in a war torn country, you know specifically in that case. But life is super hard in so many co- complex and difficult ways that everybody is suffering on some level. 
And so I would figure out a way, hopefully, to tell my 16-year-old self to learn how to accept that and to then set my expectations based off of that acceptance. Because a lot of the, the turmoil and the dif difficulty is because of some naivety and, and some pre-existing thought that things weren't supposed to be a certain way and that there's some sort of rules. Even if I wasn't aware or wasn't literally thinking that these rules exist, the naivety there implies that I had some sort of understanding of the world, which the reality is it's not any, anywhere close. And the disparity between those two things is what causes a lot of, of, of anxiety and depression and disappointment. And that really can weigh on the, on the, on the shoulders and weight on my shoulders and still can. I mean, I'm only human. So hopefully figuring out a way to initiate that concept to my 16 year old. So I don't know how I would do it. Man. <laughs> I don't know, but that yeah. I would try it that way. Yeah. That's good advice. That's very good advice. Where can the people find, find your uh, socials or your clips or your website? If you have one. Yeah, I have a website, pauldeemer.com. Um, it's got some cool bio stuff up and probably some cool clips and some cool sound clouds that needs to be updated. Going back to, I need to hire a social media team. I just really need to dive into that, accept the reality that to make to, to get where I want to be, I need to do these things that are uncomfortable for me. Um, but I got my website. I've got a uh, Instagram. Uh, uh, let's see here. Is it at, at <laughs> I should know this. <laughs> at, I think it's at Paul Deemer, at Paul M. Deemer, at Paul M. Deemer um, right. on, on Instagram, Facebook, you can type in my name. I'll have a horn in my hands, but that's the majority of, yeah, I think that's all my socials. Sounds good. Um, all those links will be in the description, of course, for those listening. Um, any last nickels before we get out of here? Mm, no, I mean, I, I just hope everybody, you know, including myself, can remember not to to take a, a life so seriously. And, and you know, to, I, I really love um, one check out Rick Glassman. He's a badass, um, also um, autistic and really has informed me a ton about that kind of acceptance and navigating the world of that and that uh, reality. But um, another person who's suspected to be autistic is Norm MacDonald. And um, mm. one of his quotes is, is something to the effect of, what value can you give a point on a line of infinity? And, it, and so I, I think about this often to help kind of not take myself down or take myself so seriously and to talk myself down from times when I'm taking things too seriously. It's like, we're all kind of these points on infinity. And it's not to say that we're meaningless, but to say that we're such, we're so small and that to have the 80 or whatever years, hopefully of being alive in this infinite, just enormous unfathomable timeline is an unbelievable privilege. And so you, if you can't take yourself that seriously um, because you, you, then it's your time's gonna be up and you were sitting here fretting the whole time with yeah. weight on your shoulders. So in, in the spirit of Norm MacDonald, you know, uh, don't take yourself so seriously. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. And to your point about it's not that we're meaningless, but we're small. It's like you you are small, but you can have a big impact on those in your little circle around you. And that's that's the thing to focus on rather than I'm gonna go save the world because right. that's not gonna happen. But if if you just start with one person, you make an impact on one person, and then they make an impact on one person, the ripple effect goes. And so that's what that's what's up for sure absolutely i love that i love that absolutely 100 yeah. all right guys i think that's a great note to get out of here we'll see you guys later peace yes sir peace